and we should be live. Let me go ahead and pop out the chat here. And we should be good to go. All right, so there's a few things I want to touch on before we have the last lecture for audio. The first of which is Jeremy and Sylvain have released a draft of their notebooks here on the fast book repo and it contains every single chapter and all is code that you can execute and run through now there is copyright restrictions on it because it is their book but I highly recommend that you guys go read it it was very very kind for Jeremy and Sylvain to go ahead and release their book and have it accessible to people that might not be able to buy it themselves. However, I highly recommend you guys do. I've already bought it myself, and I'm anxiously awaiting uh, July when it will come out. Besides that, um, we're going to touch on a few different topics today. The first of which is I want to kind of show you guys how to navigate the documentation a little, because uh, there's a little confusion about that. And then we're going to go into GANs for super resolution, a look at the FastAI audio sublibrary, and then how to prepare a um, a Siamese data loader. So let's go look at the documentation. Now you notice that I'm back on GitHub. That's because uh, really for the documentation, you should be working out of the notebooks. You shouldn't really be looking at the documentation website right now because it's not really done and it won't tell you as much. So let's take a look, for instance, at the vision data notebook. Because I'm curious about how the data loaders are being made. So if we go through and open this, I can open it in uh, Google Colab, for instance, if I really wanted to. I can take a look at what image data loaders is really looking like, all the options it has available to it, and everything that it's expecting along with any tests that might be there, such as down here for object detection. So if you're confused or want to learn about more about something, go explore the notebooks and consider them the documentation for right now. Down the road, I uh, they do want to add more true documentation, but for right now, this is what you should be using. Uh, but aside from that, let's go ahead and take a look at the notebooks for today. So we're going to be working out of 07 Super Res, basically the whole 07 bundle today. And so we're going to start with a GAN. Now, what exactly is a GAN? They're called Generative Adversarial Networks, and they were invented by Ian Goodfellow, where essentially you have two networks that play a game back and forth with each other. One tries to make the model worse, the other one tries to fix the other one's, uh, how would you call that? Fix the other one's interruptions, I guess, or attempts to make it worse. So for our case, we are going to do super resolution. And how that's going to work is we're going to build uh, one model that tries to make the images look worse and another one, or sorry, one model that tries to make the images look cleaner and the other one is going to try and differentiate between the um, fake image and the real image. Now, uh, Colab just updated all of its dependencies a little while ago. So now we only need pip install fastai2. And we're going to be working out of the vision module, and we're also going to need to get the GAN submodule in there. So first, let's make some a very quick crapifier, if you will, uh, to build our crappy data. And so all this is going to do is take in two paths, a low resolution and a high resolution. And all we're doing is drawing some random numbers 
and letters onto our images, save them away, and that is now our crappy data. So we're going to go ahead and do this on the pets data set. So we're going to make an images folder and a crappy folder. And we can use parallel processing to get our data set generation done in about 30 seconds or so. Now, if we go ahead and look at a few of our uh, crappy images, you can see that this is the original cat. And now we have it blurred a little bit along with a 35 written on top. So the goal is to remove that 35. Now let's look at the data block. So we're going to be trying to do progressive resizing. I don't show it here, but in general, progressive resizing will do better in general. But uh, when you're doing progressive resizing, it's a lot easier for you to just make a function that builds your data loaders for you. And so for today, our basic data loader is going to be image block to image block, where our Y is going to be our high resolution image and our input is going to be that low resolution image. And then uh, our number of classes or this uh, data loaders C down here is going to be three. This specifies that it's a three channel image. Depending on the problem, this will change. You know, sometimes if it's classification, we have it set to whatever the number of classes are. In this case, it's an image to image where we need to specify the number of channels we're expecting. Now, to generate our sort of super resolution images, we're going to want a pre-trained generator of sorts. So let's grab some data loaders. And here you can see that we just have some images with some text written over on some of them or it's a little blurry and then our original output that we're expecting now we're going to want some hyperparameters that we're going to pass in uh, to our model and these are just what's generally recommended so we're going to have some weight decay we're going to have a y range and remember when we look when we talked about uh key points the y range can be extremely important in narrowing down how we want our model to behave and then our generator's loss function. And then the generator itself is going to be a unit. So um, this is gonna be kind of, this is a different approach that could also be applied over to style transfer uh, with this sort of unit design. Now with style transfer specifically, we did the, um, we did the feature loss because it's been shown to do a little bit better on those particular types of problems. There's an example in the course repository for doing feature loss on super resolution as well. And so after you guys have gone through this and understand how it all kind of is working, you can go through and look at the comparisons. Now we're not gonna train the generator for too, too long. Uh, you can see I only fit for about five epochs because we want it to be kind of good at doing it but we don't want to focus on uh, having it clean too, too much because it's just one part of the formula. You can see that after a few epochs, our model has successfully taken away our 70 and any other written text that we have on there. Now what we want to do is build a critic that goes through and determines what's a, why, Y range are we expecting zero to one? No, because this actually doesn't do classification yet. This is just generating the uh, just generating the output images. This is still image to image. It's not uh, classification yet. And so now what we can do here is go through and run predictions on a data loader and save away those predictions. And let's walk through what this is actually doing because uh, there's a few lines in here that are very useful to know. So the first thing is we wanna get rid of the augmentation of our training data loader, uh, remove its shuffle and its drop of the last one. And so we can go through and do a uh, train.new, which grabs the training data loader 
and generates a new unshuffled version that has these added after batch transforms. We can pass that into our uh, generative learner and uh, go through and grab some predictions. And if we look at what each prediction are, it's a three channel image. So from here, if we want to take this prediction and get back an image, we can call decodes on our on any of the transforms. And so it's a little bit weird to read how this nomenclature is going, but in general, decode expects a tuple of generally some x's and or some y's. And so here we're going to pass in one prediction. This none simply means that we set it alone as a batch. And then we uh, basically grab the second inner array. And then we can convert it to a numpy image and transpose the dimensions. That way we get back our three channel that pillow and uh, matplotlib would be expecting to look at. And now we can see our generated image. So now that we have our generated images done, we can go ahead and save them all away. And now we have the basic setup to run our classification of is it a generated image or is it not? So we're going to want to create a critic data loader. Now there's a bug with the uh, with specifically get image files and the data block API. So we're going to go one level under to the data sets where we're going to go ahead and randomly split, create a data set from our file names, which is our generated and our images. And we're going to classify it as either zero or one, or basically generated or non-generated and build some data loaders. And so now we can see which ones were just flat images. And then in this particular batch, there was not the other kind, but we can also see which ones were the originals. Now the loss here is going to be uh, more BCE with lost logits that we saw er uh, a few weeks ago. And then our actual learner is going to be a GAN critic, which has its own special class in FastAI. And now we can fit this critic model. And so far, they've been kind of been independent of each other, not really playing this game. It's just we built one model that goes ahead and fixes everything, and then another model that can kind of tell between what's a generated and fixed image and what's not. So now that we have all the pieces, we can combine them together into what is the GAN. So we'll go ahead and get our critic data loaders one more time, create our critic and create our generator. And what essentially we're gonna have happen is they're gonna be playing a tug of war between themselves. And so we're gonna train the discriminator as many times as it's needed until it starts doing pretty good. Once it starts doing good, then we're gonna try and make the generated images a little bit harder. And basically from there, we're gonna be repeating this process where the model's gonna do a little better, and then we're gonna make the data set a little bit more harder. Now we're going to have a callback right here that allows us to do uh, basically discriminative learning rates with our GAN so that each model can have a different learning rate. You can go through and explore what all this is really doing, but uh, basically on the beginning of the batch, we go ahead and set our learning rates, which need to happen in the optimizer. And then after the batch, go ahead and reset the optimizer if necessary. And then this actual switcher that we want 
is called the adaptive GAN switcher, and we just set some kind of threshold that we want. And so now we can generate our GAN learner, which we're going to pass in our two learners, some weights that we want to use, whether or not we want to show the images every time we do a batch, our switcher, potentially our optimizer, along with any callbacks we want to use. And now we can go ahead and fit. So I just used fit here. It's what Jeremy used. You can certainly use fit one cycle. And you can see that our crit loss never really varies from uh, 0.65 or so. And if we go back to here, we can see that's because once we hit 0.65, the generator starts going back into play. And so if we follow how these losses are actually going, all right, we got 0.66, go back down, the generator loss and the crit loss goes back down. 0.65, the generator loss goes back up because we switched. And so we can sort of follow and track this as the model slowly gets harder and harder. And what we get out of it is sort of this super resolution image that focuses on using these two models to remove certain aspects from our picture. So I will go ahead and let you guys explore this notebook. Uh, there's a few others on the course repo that I will link to afterwards. Um, and you guys can go through and explore it. But from there, let's take a look at uh, something that's come up quite a bit, and that is the Siamese data loader. So what exactly is a Siamese problem? Essentially, we're trying to identify if A and B are the same. And so here we're looking at pets. Is this cat the same as this cat? It's either true or false, and uh, this could be applied in a variety of circumstances. For instance, person identification, or if you have a very, very small sample size for a classification data set where it might not be good to use our standard you know, image classification. One example that I have mentioned here is, let's say I own three dogs and I want to differentiate between them in any given photo, but I only have about, say, five images. Normally, we wouldn't be able to do anything because that's in total 15 images to work off of. But since we have this sort of A, B problem, now we have 120 different samples, not including augmentation, which is enough for us to do something. So we're going to go ahead and build this example from pets, but I'm not going to show all the steps as in we're going to build one data loader. Uh, I'm going to leave it to you guys to move from one data loader to two and generating the data bunch. But at this point, you guys should have all the tools in your toolkit in order to get this to work. Obviously, if you run into issues, we can discuss it on the uh, course thread. But uh, try it out and uh, see how far you get, because you might not realize you know as much as you do. So the first thing we're going to want to do is uh, we're the whole point of today's lesson for this is we're not going to use any of the mid-level API or even the high level. Everything is going to be low level because we're building the data loader. So first, let's focus on the data set itself. So we're going to want to just simply open an image and resize it to some arbitrary size. That's the first thing we're going to do. And so we're going to make a little transform called resized image that takes in a path and some size and does exactly that. So if we look at two random images here, uh, image one and image two, we'll go ahead and try comparing them. Now we don't really have an image type for this problem and a show function. So we can create a new class that's called titled image. And all it does is uh, fast.ai has a nice little show titled image function where we can pass in some image and a title. And so here we can pass in our first image along with 
say some title like test and hit show and now we have a titled image and so let's use this idea to make a pair of images something similar to what we'd want a Siamese to expect and so all we do is call show image and we're going to concatenate the two of our images together and just have some title now in reality when you're doing these problems you're not going to concatenate them but we care about it for viewing how the data looks and so now we can grab two more examples that look remarkably similar to the images that we had in the beginning of the lesson and we have our titled image now let's move on to something that'll actually build the data set though, because that really doesn't build the data set. That just helps us look at the data set. And for that, we're going to want the Siamese pair transform. And I want you guys to not think about data loaders, data sets, or anything like that right now. Let's take a step back because otherwise you're gonna be stuck in a rabbit hole. So the current situation is I have my data, okay? I have all of my images known, and I already have all of the possible labels for those images. And so that's what this transform is going to expect. And now uh, what we're gonna do from here is create a class mapping and uh, when we're generating the data set, we're going to go ahead and generate two of the, or a Siamese image based off of uh, the two inputs, essentially, together. And we're going to randomly select an image from all of our images as the partner to some X. And it has a random chance of becoming either the same or different. And so this output here is simply going to return, uh, while it is our Siamese image, what that really says is we have image one, image two, and whether or not they're the same value. And this will already be prepared for us to just throw into a model because we already encode our uh, tensor value here. And so let's look at what exactly that looks like. So we'll go ahead and generate a labeler, something to extract our labels from our data set. And we can map everything to our labeler. And so now what we do is we, if we look at our labels, we can see that, okay, we have our classes. And if we look at the length of them, it's the length of our data set. And so now we have a list of items and we have their corresponding labels. And so now we can generate our sentence, our Siamese pair data set. Now that class mapping I mentioned earlier, what that really does is it basically says what indexes are what particular class. And so here you can see this entire data set, we have roughly 200 of each class at these corresponding indices. And then if we look at the labels, it's just simply the labels of all of our classes. And so now that we have this, we have our pipeline. So let's look at transforming all of this into a data loader. And I wanted to show you guys this because I spent quite a few weeks struggling to get this all working until finally uh, Sylvain helped something click for me. So the first thing we're gonna to wanna to do is remember that resized image function we had? We're going to want to make that into a transform. And uh, all that really means is we give it the ability to have an encode. So we can just wrap it in a transform and we'll call it open and resize. And for those of you wondering, yes, you can wrap any function inside of a transform. And now we have the pieces to put together. And so we can build a pipeline. And if we look at the first set, from this pipeline or this first uh, item, we have our batch. We have two image inputs and whether or not they're the same. Now that's great, 
everything's trapped in this pipeline now. So how do I take it from this pipeline and move it over to this data loader that we're expecting our models to use? Well, that's actually really, really simple. First, we need to trans we need to create what's called a transformed list, which is kind of what it sounds like. You have a transformed list of something. So transformed list can either get a bunch of values or if we have a predetermined pipeline like we have here that already has all our values, we can instead give it a list of indexes. And so we're gonna say generate a transformed list, that's the range of my items, and have it follow our pipeline here. And now we can build our data loader and add any sort of after batch, after item transforms that we might want. In this case, we're gonna wanna normalize our data. Now we can look at a batch, and I wasn't quite able to get the show function working in time for this, but I did at the very least want to show you guys how to get the transformed list to the data loaders. So we're going to fall back to PyTorch a bit and Torch Vision to take a look at it. But if we convert everything back over, we can see that it's a one, which means they're not the same. And if we look at what we actually have, we have two cats that aren't the same. And now you have a data loader that's ready to be passed in. From here, you should probably generate a training data loader too. Either that or split it to some degree. Uh, also, you can do augmentation with Siamese. What that would wind up looking like is you either augment the first image or the second image. Um, I wasn't quite able to get that done in time like I was hoping, so if you guys are trying to explore how that works, uh, my best recommendation would be do it at a batch level. That way you modify all of the incoming first input X's or second input X's, similar to uh, some of the bounding box transforms. But is there any questions on the Siamese lower level stuff? All right. There's no questions, let's move over to the last module, which is probably gonna take the rest of class and I'm gonna try and get through it as seamlessly as I can. However, audio is not my forte, so we're gonna try and roll with it. So FastDI V1 had the start of a audio library through uh, some wonderful people on the forums and that was then further pushed with uh, FastAI version two, uh, specifically by our Braco, Kevin Bird, uh, Mogwai, Hiromi, and others into what is called FastAI2 Audio, which is a separate module for dealing with audio files. And specifically, how do we convert it over into something a neural network would expect? And that's kind of what makes audio a little bit different. Sure, we could simply do like a 1D tensor and either use a tabular model or use a one-dimensional CNN, but uh, research has shown that do, using a spectrogram instead uh, can actually help with that a bit more. And so we start with something that looks like this sort of wave image and turn it into something a little bit more pattern-esque and full, I guess would be one way of putting it. Uh, now to install it, there isn't quite a pip install FastAI2 audio yet, I believe, because they're still working on it. But for right now, we can just pip install it like we do for the FastAI2 dev version. And for today's example, we're gonna be using what's called the free digit data set. Essentially, it's the audio version of MNIST, so it has about 2,000 different recordings from four different speakers where they say each digit around five times. 
And so same exact thing, number classification, but instead we're classifying the individual person. So we can call uh, vision and the various modules that we need from audio that we would expect, core and augment. Now it's going to look a little bit different in how they named things, but they all kind of form on the same way. So here we have a helper function called tar extracted file name. And all that really does is it makes untar data extract at wherever the file name or folder was originally. And so we're going to go ahead and um, pass that into untar data. And for our file names, we're going to want to specifically go grab the audio files. So we can just call get files, pass in the predetermined audio extensions that FastAI2 Audio provides. And now we have our list of file audio names. Now this is all like a lower level version. Uh, obviously there are medium and higher level APIs to help you build your data loaders a bit faster to where you don't have to go through these smaller steps. So let's look at what these audio tensors are. So this if we pass in uh, audio tensor create we get this audio tensor that's one by uh, six three thousand four hundred and fifty one and let's see if it will play for me nine. here we have an example of a nine. nine and this is what our input data is going to wind up looking like so fast ai2 audio has a few different configurations that allow us to prepare it in a few different ways, and all of them are based off of uh, recent papers. So we have uh, some basic ML spectrograms, MFCC, a spectrogram, and then a special voice module specifically. Uh, we'll be using the voice because this data set just contains human voices. And so we'll pass a configuration file that expects a vo or configuration that expects voice. Now, if we look at what this actually sets, uh, it has a lot of different values that limit, for instance, the frequency range and the sampling rate, as we can see here. And so that's all these predetermined configurations really are. You can pass them already into audio config to make your own, but uh, we're going to start with just this configuration file. And now we can uh, use this configuration to build a transform that generates our spectrograms. And so that's called audio to spec. Along with that, uh, so along with sort of how we had all of our images need to be the same size, all of our audio needs to be the same length. So we're gonna go ahead and just take one second and just crop it, crop everything after one second. So to try and visualize what we got going on from here now, uh, we're going to go ahead and build a pipeline. So first let's just do audio to spec from an audio tensor. So if we run through a few different file names, we see that we have our input gets generated into this single channel image. And Every single one of them looks radically different. It's honestly kind of pretty in a way. But you also notice that they're not exactly all the same size. Because here we have 128 by 27. Here we have 128 by 31. And here we have another 128 by 31. So now we're going to want our crop one second. That way everything is set to some predetermined pixel value. So here we have 63, 63, and 63. All right, so now that we kind of understand what the lower level pieces are doing, let's try and put it together. So we're going to want an appropriate getter, an appropriate label, and those transforms that we used earlier. So we're going to use crop signal and audio to spec again. For this particular problem, the file name or the labels are the first in, uh, number in the file name. So our get y can just be a lambda function that grabs the name of the file and grabs its first position. 
And now we can build a data block with an audio block module. And it's just as simple as calling data loaders. And we're all set. Because here you can see, now we have our crop signal and everything is transformed to our spectrogram. They just worked on show batch, so uh, it's not quite as full as some other ones, but we can see here that we have our first three images and they all have the value of eight. Now, since these are uh, one channel images, we want to adjust our learner to accept a one channel input, kind of similar to what we did for the Kaggle competition uh, last week. So um, Kevin Bird made a alter learner function that works really well at just changing your model to accept one uh, particular channel. Now, if you want to do two channels instead of one, um, just kind of look at how MNIST does theirs. But here we can pass in our learner, grab the number of input channels that we have, and pass that into our alter learner. And here we're going to use an uh, X ResNet. And now we can fit it for a few epochs, and you can see that it doesn't take long for us to hit about 96%. Not too bad. And that's really without any augmentation. That is just strictly running from our input signal and providing it as an image. So let's look at a few of the augmentations that we have available to us. So the first one is this spectrogram transformer class. And if we go back to our audio to spec settings, you can see that we have all these different options that we can use. So let's go ahead and narrow them down a bit. So you'll notice a few of these are repeats from the uh, minimum values, but a few of them aren't. And then for our transforms, we have a few different options and uh, let's go over kind of what they do. So remove silence basically looks for whenever there is silence in the audio and then removes and splits off uh, the audio at that particular point. Crop signal, we already saw, uh, basically crops a signal by some allotted duration. Or if it's too small, then it will add padding. Audio to spec, that's our spectrogram print, uh, transform. Mask time is a wrapper for mask frequency. Basically, it's a collection of Einstein operations based off of this spec augment time masking paper that you guys can read here. And the padding for crop signal actually has three different types. So zeros, which is the default, adds a random number of zeros from the beginning and to the end of the tensor. Repeat, repeats the signal until a proper length has been hit. And then zeros after, which is the default for a lot of different libraries, just pad zeros until you get the specified length. Um, we're not going to be using repeat today because that's terrible for our choice since we care about just the full complete sound of one number. And also the default for this library is to use audio pad zeros. So let's go through and rebuild our data block with these new transforms. So we're going to have our remove silence, crop signal, our audio to spectrogram, mask time, followed by mask frequency. And now our data loader looks a lot different. We have these essentially crossed T's uh, messing with our images, more or less. And so now we'll go ahead and train again. And in order to make everything run a little bit faster, I've created an audio learner function where you can pass in the data loaders, architecture, some loss function, and some metrics for you to use. Now it'll only alter the learner if we have a one channel image. 
So uh, we'll look at why that's important a little bit later. So we'll go ahead and fit a ResNet 18. And you can see that we were able to get a little bit higher than what we got last time. About 96.5% versus the 96.25 that we got last time. So let's look at a few of the other options. So that MFCC that I mentioned earlier is the MEL frequency sepstrel coefficient, a mouthful. Basically, it's a linear cosine transform of a log power spectrum on a nonlinear MEL scale of frequency. Basically, take a whole bunch of lines and try and fit it linearly, or take a whole bunch of waves essentially, and try and find some linear representat uh, representation of it. So we can go ahead and set some default values for our audio to MFCC, adjust our item transforms, and instead of rebuilding the data block every time, we can just simply override the item transforms with our new ones, build our data loaders, and now everything looks a lot differently uh, compared to how it did before. So we generated our images uh, with this new sort of linear standpoint, I guess you could call it. And so let's go ahead and fit again. And this actually brings us up to a 97% in five epochs. And so here's a really good example of where thinking about the augmentation that you do or even doing augmentation can really help your model out. And so sort of the last transform we're going to look at is delta, which delta is more or less defined as a local estimate of the derivative of an input data along some axis. And essentially what that means is we can generate multiple channels off of one signal. And so we can see that where we have our different channel, Im like channel image zero, channel image one, channel image two. And so now our input is a three channel image again. And so that's why we made that one change to uh, audio learner to where it's not just always the number of channels is one. And so now if we pass this back in, fit for a few more epochs, we can push it more or less to 98.25%. So the audio library, I've honestly been blown away by it. It's very impressive and it's still in development, kind of like how fast AI2 is, uh, but they're a little bit heavier in the development stage. So everything's at a very, very basic level. Uh, I'm very thankful to uh, Robert for helping me make this, um, this tutorial. And honestly, a lot of it was his work that uh, I kind of play, played around with for a bit. So I'm very thankful for him. Uh, go check out the FastAI2 audio mega thread and the FastAI audio thread as well. If you guys are interested in this sort of stuff, I'll link it over after uh, we're done here. But besides that, uh, that's about all I have for the vision block for you guys. Um, next week, we're going to do a pandas workshop. That way everyone's kind of up to speed and on an even playing ground with how pandas really works. And we'll start to get a look at how FastAI operates its tabular data. But besides that, thank you guys for joining me today. And I will see you all next week.